My name is Richard Lane. I'm the regimental historian for the Leicestershire Regiment and I specialise in studying the First World War movements of the regiment. We're here today at the Thiepval Memorial on the Somme, which commemorates 73,500 men who were totally lost. They were never found. No trace of them was ever found. Included on the memorial are about 900 members of the Leicestershire Regiment who died in various battles, but mainly at Vizentin Le Petit. A lot of these guys have been together since 1914 when they formed up in Leicester. They'd have great friendships between themselves and also the junior officers who led them for a fairly small county regiment. I mean, we were very heavily involved. We were engaged in some of the major battles. The 110th Leicestershire Brigade were involved in two major battles, the first one being Bazentin Ridge and the second one at Guidacourt at the end of September. I've been coming over here for many, many years, tracing the footsteps, if you like, of the regiment following basically the various battles and conflicts the Leicestershire Regiment was involved in during the Battle of the Somme, which started on July the 1st, 1916. Well, Burl was the first village that two battalions came to in July 1915. When you're talking about 1,500, 1,600 men in the village, you know, it's a lot of people. And they had to be supplied, fed, watered, everything else, which was quite a big logistical problem. I mean, all these boys were forming up for the Battle of the Somme the following July. They all knew what was coming, but they didn't know when it was coming, and they were training all over the place. You know, companies had gone for special training, machine gun training, all sorts of things all over the place, behind the lines, obviously. But they still had to hold the front line, which they do by rotation with companies and battalions, you know, probably four or 500 men in the front line. And as you'll see here, quite a few guys got killed. There's 37 in this cemetery, either killed by sniper fire, which Germans were very good at, or by spasmodic shell fire. And the water table is very high around here, and most of the time they're probably standing in easily a foot, probably two foot of water in the winter of 15, which was pretty awful and very, very cold, apparently. And they got trench foot. A lot of people went ill. The soldiers were drinking out of foul water, got dysentery and all sorts of things, and there was quite a steady stream of, you know, medical casualties being treated. And so it went on, and they became, you know, an extremely highly regarded brigade and they stayed here for some considerable time and they obviously got to know the locals very well. The uh, residents of Burl looked after them very, very well. They knew the why they were here, I mean they were fighting for France, weren't they, basically. Well I have an appointment in about five minutes with the mayor and he wants to show me the things in the museum so I'm going to have to leave you for a bit. Well, Dick Reed was one of the original soldiers who joined the 110th Brigade in Leicester in 1914, along with lots of his friends, all Leicester people. Mr. Mayor, um, why are you so keen to keep the relationship going with the Reed family in the Leicestershire Regiment? The family of uh, Berlebois yep. um, remember uh, the presence of uh, Regiment of Leicester. What is the importance of having the Dick Reed Square here to the people of Burl? It's uh, very important for the memory. Yeah. Uh, we are very proud, proud. because uh, uh, the Leicester Regiment and its uh, soldiers, uh, it's for the li liberty yeah. and uh, the memory. That's right, it's, uh, yes. It's for the memory. I think it's marvellous after a hundred odd years we've kept this relationship going with Burl. So we leave this pleasant little village of 
Berlobois, three kilometers from the front line trenches and about a quarter of a kilometer from the German front line at Monchy le Preau. And we take with us the memory of that terrible winter of 1915 to 16, when brave men and callow youth, who were men before their time, were tested to the limits of their endurance. In the terrible conditions of knee-deep mud and waterlogged trenches, with the trenches falling in left, right and centre, rations scarce, sleep impossible. When the relief battalion took over at dusk, the rain had ceased, and we officers and men alike trudged warily down the communication trench as best we could, over the top where they had collapsed, till we reached the Berl-Monchy Road. We sat by the wayside in all the mud and slime to rub whale grease into our dead white feet, painful and wrinkled like a walnut shell, with very little feeling. Great-hearted men, some who were yet boys, wept bitter tears at the frustration and futility of it all. We were left alone the next day, to sleep, rest and dry out. So we paraded and left the memories behind us as the long march began. Well, we're now standing on the edge of Mametz Wood, looking across the road to the extensive size of Byzantine Le Petit Wood. On the 14th of July, 1916, the Leicestershire Regiment, four battalions of them, the 6th, 7th, 8th and 9th battalions were ordered to attack and hold and keep Byzantine Wood and the village. The two leading battalions formed up here in extended line, remembering they've got a load of kit on rifles, grenades, bayonets, loads of ammunition, and they started to advance dead on time at 3.20. They hit the wood straight into the Germans, but the Germans, as usual, responded very heavily. And what happened then was a hell of a fight, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, bayonet fighting, grenade fighting. The result was that one battalion lost pretty well every single officer of the 8th Battalion, but they got into the wood and started to clear the trenches. But the Germans being the Germans, they were well dug in and fought like tigers. They really did. It was a hell of a battle. Hell of a battle. And the greatest battle the Leicesters ever fought, in actual fact. And a company sergeant major called Robert Hancock gathered together the remnants of the four battalions and formed a defensive line at the north of the wood and waiting for the Germans to attack, but instead he decided to attack them. The Leicesters drove the Germans right back. Company Sergeant Major Hancock was very badly wounded, but for this he was awarded the Military Cross, which was very unusual for a Company Sergeant Major. He was 38 years old. When they were leading out of Mametz Wood further down the road, the Prince of Wales was standing there, patting the boys on the back, good luck and all this sort of thing. And the story is told that when the attack went in, he started to follow because he wanted to follow the boys into the attack and he had to be physically restrained from doing so. And I told this story to Prince Charles when he opened the museum a few years ago, showing him where it happened and photographs. And Prince Charles turned around and said, that man would never surprise me. Be an awful lot of very close hand to hand fighting with bayonets and Mills bombs, you know, because our boys would be stumbling across Germans in trenches and they'd either lob a Mills bomb in, bayonet them, shoot them at point blank range. It would be a fairly awful, bloody affair. Well, the total casualties for the battle were 1,947 men, either killed or wounded. There's 880 of our boys on the Theatre Memorial. The majority of them are still in here. They just couldn't, you know, they might have been blasted to smithereens by shell fire or just buried by German artillery. But there's certainly a lot still left in here, which is rather a sobering thought, I find, quite frankly, when you walk through here. Very sad. And you've got to remember, a lot of these guys were sort of 18, 19, 20 year old, the boys, a lot of them. The vast majority be under 22. Hundreds and hundreds of them. I find it a very sad and sobering thought, actually. There's so many 
of our boys still here. July 14th. Brigade attacked this morning at 3.25 a.m. and took Byzantin Wood, Byzantin Le Petit, and Byzantin Le Grand. 146 men of my company killed, wounded, and missing. 582 of the battalion. Every officer of my company killed. I lost most of my friends this day. Went up to the new front with rations, and the most ghastly sight met our eyes. Dead men every few yards, and the whole place smells stale with the slaughter which has been going on for the past 14 days. The smell of the dead and lacrimatory gas. The place is a very hell, with the whistling and crashing of shells, bursting shrapnel, and the rattle of machine guns. The woods we had taken had not yet been cleared, and there were pockets of Germans with machine guns still holding out and doing some damage. A sergeant sinks to the ground beside me, with a bullet wound neatly drilled through his shoulder. Lucky man. It's not likely to prove fatal. It's too clean, and it means a few months in Blighty for him. July 16th. Battalion came out of the line and bivouacked at Mamet's. I had to call the roll of the company, and this was a heartbreaking business. The answer to most of the names was killed. All men who were not definitely known to have been killed were posted as missing. For this, we had to rely on the knowledge of the few survivors, of course. On the 25th of September 1916, four battalions of the Leicestershire Regiment attacked the village of Guidacourt to our front. The village was very heavily defended and they ran into very heavy machine gun fire as soon as they came over the ridge behind me. Well, this was the last main Somme engagement of the 110th Leicester Brigade and when they were told they were going to have to do another attack after Byzantin Ridge, there was a lot of resentment because they'd taken such heavy casualties, you know, a couple of months before. The German defences consisted of three trench lines running from left to right in front of the village. They'd be deep, probably seven to eight feet deep, with bunkers in them, machine guns, etc., etc. One of the Leicester battalions got into the first trench system and gave the Germans some hard fighting with grenades and bayonets etc and held it and the Germans drew back but then as usual the Germans brought up reinforcements and we were stuck. After about 20 minutes a tank came rumbling down this road which is called Watling Street and ran straight into the German front line firing down the trench line with machine guns and six pounder guns which mincemeated the, the Germans and then they went on into the village and did the same there. However the Germans had got considerable reserves in the village. <clears throat> By this time, the Leicesters were taking very, very heavy casualties, you know, four to five hundred men down, and it was becoming very disruptive fighting, and they held and stopped to re-establish themselves. The battle actually started, which is most strange, at 12.25 p.m., which is most unusual in broad daylight. I mean, there was sitting duck coming over this ridge for heavy machine gun fire, they battled on and on and eventually got into the village where there was a lot of close quarter fighting with bayonets and mills bombs, which is the favourite weapon for clearing houses. And then they were reorganised and held back and another regiment came in and took over from the uh, Leicester battalions. It was a great success. They'd done exceptionally well in the Somme battles. Another laurel to the Leicesters, basically. Once again, at a hell of a cost. The casualties were about 600, about 400 killed. We're now standing in Serre No. 2 Cemetery, just outside the village of Serre. There are over, just over 7,000 graves in the cemetery, and the, the significance is it's a very similar figure of casualties to the Leicestershire Regiment, just over 7,000 in the whole of the First World War. Well, it makes you realise, you know, the terrible suffering, really, and the absolutely incredible casualties. When you consider all the young men who came from Leicester, aged from 17 to 30, who volunteered in 1914, and thousands of them never came back, and thousands came back badly wounded, there'd hardly be a family in the whole of the country in the First World War which wasn't in some way affected, whether it's fathers, brothers, uncles, 
killed, wounded. The Leicesters had something like 24,000 casualties, people wounded, but there are no real record whether they lost a leg, an arm, or, you know, whatever. But they're probably crippled for life. But I do believe now that um, there's been such a surge of interest over the last few years, which is very good because people should realise the sacrifice these people made. I mean, they're all young men, you know, the bags of 17-year-olds who never should have been here. You know, they were mere boys. They, they were, were not supposed to come on foreign service till they were 19, but, you know, they lied about their age, encouraged by the recruiting sergeants to get in. <laughs> but that's how it was, basically. Although it was one of the smaller regiments in the, in the country, I mean, you know, they did the job and they did it very, very well, quite frankly. It's remembering these guys, and I think they should never, ever be forgotten for the sacrifice they made. As I turn the pages of memory at the going down of the sun and in the dark watches of the night, I remember them, my comrades of long ago. In peace be vigilant, for peace needs no defence, only a defender. The noise of the battle has long since faded and died away. The great guns that once spewed their hate o'er the Flanders plains are silent and only remembered by we few, we pitiful few. All that remains of the great army, pride of our race, the remnants of a lost generation. Too honest to steal, too proud to beg, charity we scorn, pity we dread. The people pray for God, and the soldiers in time of war, both are forgotten when the war is over. But we who are left, remember.